envelope. This will be a demonstration of Book 2, Proposition 1, which states that if there be two straight lines and one of them is cut into any number of segments, the rectangle contained by the two straight lines will equal the sum of the rectangles contained by the uncut straight line and each of the segments. It's a weird enunciation. Doesn't, it's not exactly obvious what that means, but given an example, I think it makes it clear. So given two straight lines, we will call these A and BC, and we will say that BC is cut at random intervals, any number of them, Euclid has chosen two and so have I, um, at random points D and E. And now this states that the rectangle contained by A and BC will equal the rectangle contained by A and BD plus the rectangle contained by A and DE plus the rectangle contained by A and EC. So when he talks about segments, it's just the parts that are made by the points on the straight line. So step one will obviously begin with constructing the rectangles. So we will start by drawing BF at right angles to BC from point B. And this will be using proposition 111 because we're drawing a straight line perpendicular to a given straight line from a point on it, which is why we don't use 112. Okay, so we've drawn BF perpendicular to BC. And now we will cut off from BF. We'll cut off from BF BG such that BG is equal to A. And we can do this by one, three, given two unequal straight lines to cut off from the greater a straight line equal to the lesser. Okay, sweet. So we have BG perpendicular to BC at point B and BG equal to A. This is awesome. <laughs> and now we're going to draw GH parallel to BC from point G. And we do this because of prop, and we can do this by proposition 131 to draw a straight line parallel to a given straight line from a given, or through a given point. Okay, and now we use proposition 131 several times over just in the perpendicular direction. So for example, we are going to draw G, no, we're going to draw DK perpendicular, not perpendicular, parallel to BG. We are going to draw EL parallel to BG or DK. We're going to draw CH parallel to BG, DK, or EL. These lines are all parallel to each other, so you can use whichever one is your reference. So let's draw these lines. So the lines with one arrows in them are parallel to each other, the lines with two arrows in them are parallel to each other, but a straight line with one arrow through it is not parallel to a straight line with two arrows through it. This is simply the notation I use for um, parallel lines. Um, this is the first video starting at book two and I'm going to be going to the end of book 13. Um, yeah, you're going to see that a lot. <laughs> so do recognize what I'm doing. Okay, cool. And now we are done with the construction. We have done all that needs to be constructed. And so now it's simply on to the demonstration. Um, now to make this um, more smooth and more linear demonstration, I'm going to be differentiating a little bit from the book. So I will start out with a step. And this step says that because BG is parallel to DK, is parallel to EL, is parallel to CH, right? The, we made these lines all parallel to each other and I'm simply um, repeating that. We know that BG is equal to DK is equal to EL is equal to CH. These lines are all equal to each other because they are opposite sides in, a, in parallelogramic areas. And so by proposition 134, we know that the opposite sides and parallelograms are equal to each other. So we can say that BG is equal to DK is equal to EL is equal to CH. And there is one more line that these are equal to. Because BG is equal to A, DK, EL, and CH are also equal to A. This is simply common notion one. We've been doing this since literally the first proposition. <laughs> okay, so we have all these equal straight lines. 
amazing. Now, because BG is equal to A, because we made it that way, this is simply referring back to step one, and the rectangle BH is contained by BC and BG, and this is simply self-evident, we can say that the rectangle BH will equal the rectangle that would be contained by BC and A. Note that this rectangle contained by BC and A does not exactly exist, but we have a straight line equal to A, and so we can use this as a proxy for the rectangle contained by this actual straight line and this actual straight line. And so, simply using a property of magnitude, a common notion like thing, usually dealing with equalities, but not exactly a common notion, not enumerated among the common notions, um, substituting one side of a, um, substituting one containing side of a rectangle for an equal uh, straight line is a property of magnitudes. And that's what Euclid is doing here. He's saying that because the rectangle BH is the rectangle is the rectangle contained by BC and BG because these are the straight lines containing the right angle we can substitute one side for another namely BG for A cool and that's step 3 step 4 is the exact same thing just dealing with different rectangles so similarly I have not repeated the reasoning because it is the exact same as step 3 we're carrying it over just with different objects we can say that the rectangle BK is the rectangle is equal to the rectangle contained by BD and A. We can say that the rectangle DL is is equal to the rectangle contained by DE and A, and that the rectangle EH is equal to the rectangle contained by EC and A. This is the exact same reasoning as step four, swapping out one containing side for an equal length, and so. I have not repeated the reasoning. Now, final step. We know that the rectangle BH is, is equal to BK plus DL plus EH. This, again, is self-evident. We can swap out these terms for their equals. And so, for example, we know that BH is equal to the rectangle contained by BC and A. I should actually write these steps off in the reasoning. That's my bad. This refers back to step three to four, and we'll use a property of magnitudes. So in each of the terms of inequality, we can swap out, swap them out for the equals. This is not exactly common notion one because we're dealing with sums, but it's the same essence. And so we can say that BH, which is equal to the rectangle contained by AB and BC, is equal to the rectangle contained by BD and A, the rectangle contained by A, a and D E and the rectangle contained by A and E C. And well, this is what was set out to be proven. We have accomplished what our specification requires us to accomplish, and now the and now the proposition is finished. So we simply therefore, etc. And QED. Now a few things to note in this proposition. One is that um, properties of magnitude will be used quite a lot in book two. Um, I mean, there's only two here, but as the propositions go on, they will come up over and over and over again, and it's simply um, necessary to recognize them, that even though Euclid does not enumerate them among his common notions or postulates, they are nonetheless true. Euclid simply saying that something is true does not make it true, and so he can, and so he can use what is true, and he is not simply restricted to what he says is true. <laughs> So the common use of properties of magnitudes, you will have to recognize these because they will come up often in book two. Um, a few other, two other things. Um, the notation for rectangles has shifted a little bit. So in book one, for example, we would have parallelogram A, B, C, D, and the parallelogram will be denoted by all four of its points. And now, in book two, and we saw this at the end of book one, but this is going to be normal now, parallelograms will be de denoted by their diagonal, which is why we say that this rectangle, BDKG, is simply rectangle BK, and this rectangle is simply DL, and this rectangle is simply EH, and this whole rectangle is simply BH, because these are the diagonals of the rectangle, and so we also denote rectangles by their diagonals. 
Um, this again is something you ought to be very cognizant about as this will be normal going forward. Euclid will not normally denote rectangles by four points but instead only by their diagonals. So do recognize that two letters can both mean a straight line, right? they, it can mean the straight line BC, or the two letters BH can mean a whole rectangle. The final thing to note in book one, and this will be a theme in, in book, or not, final thing to note in book two, and this will be the theme of book two, is that these are, will all be algebraic principles that you will, met, that you will already recognize if you are in a standard uh, middle school or high school um, maths program, but they're demonstrated geometrically. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take, um, let's take each of the straight, let's, let's just take this and put it in algebraic terms. So we will call this simply A, we will call the straight line BD simply B, we will call DEC, and we will call this straight line EC simply D. Okay, now let's replace what's in the enunciation here. Okay, so A times, this is what containing means, it's, it's equivalent to multiplication. So A times BC, well, this is going to be A times B plus C plus D. This will equal A times BD, so simply AB plus A times C, simply AC, and A times D, simply AD. Now, hopefully, you will recognize this as simply the distributive property, right? When you have one term multiplied by a sum, you can take that term and multiply it by the individual terms, and these will be equivalent expressions. And that is all that is going on here in this algebra. And what Euclid has done in Proposition 2.1 is demonstrated that geometrically, using rectangles as equivalent to multiplication, using straight line as the equivalent of variables. Obviously, Euclid didn't, you know, he didn't have the algebra in mind, but this is now how we would understand this proposition, putting in, in the common algebraic terms. And this will come up often in book two. Book two, many of the truths will be truths that you will recognize if you put them in algebraic terms. So, recognize, so I, I, I would recommend that at the end of every proposition, you put it into these algebraic terms and see if you recognize the truths being expressed as something you may already know. I think this will not only help um, the bridge between this very different mathematics that we're doing right now found in the elements of Euclid and the mathematics we've done all before this. And I think we'll also substantiate the principles that we well know from middle and high school math. And so those are things to note about Proposition 2.1. And going forward, I will do all demonstrations of all the propositions in book two. So I will see you all later.